Welcome to episode 143 of the Necronama.com. I am James Sabata, horror author, screenwriter, co-host of the podcast you're listening to right now. And for ever, any like supernatural creatures listening, I believe in Santa 100% and celebrate Christmas all year round. And I'm Don Guillory, author, historian, educator, co-host of this podcast. And uh, I just kept waiting for Belchnickel to show up. But, you know, oh that's just me. <laughs> <laughs> you win this round. All right. So joining us today, William Sterling is back on the show. Welcome, welcome, welcome back, man. Hey, thanks for having me back. I enjoyed last time. I'm going to enjoy this time. Excellent. I believe you, uh, you got to talk about one of my favorite movies of all time when you were last here. So, I mean, that's always exciting. Yeah. So, there we go. Um, so, why don't you tell our listeners a bit about yourself, man? Sure. Um, I am a self-published novelist. Um, been involved in the horror community for a few years now absolutely love it um and just really excited to talk about krampus and to get into the christmas spirit of resenting and then murdering the ones we love (laughs) i mean that's what the season's really about so that works out well Uh, what about you don have you ever murdered any of your family members at christmas you know what maybe you shouldn't answer that (laughs) let's I'm not a big fan of holidays and holiday get togethers. Uh, And in fact, the first 15 minutes of this movie reminds me of why I don't (laughs) have people over for holidays. Like my mom, she's, she's coming to visit um, for, for this year. And I've, she always forgets like what our routine is because we, we throw uh, Jewish Christmas, which for those of you who don't know, it's basically you just go and enjoy Chinese food because there's a historical connection. I'm not Jewish. I want to make that clear. Um, but we observe Jewish Christmas or Jewish practices on Christmas um, because in the United States, um, Jewish communities and Chinese communities uh, started to you know uh, work together uh, uh, in, in and uh, frequent each other's shops, restaurants, things like that. So on Christmas, there wasn't a place for Jewish families to go and eat or get things. So they would go to uh, the Chinese restaurants. So talking about places like New York, San Francisco, Chicago. Um, so on Christmas, it became a tradition for a lot of Jewish families and a lot of families that don't recognize Christmas to actually go and get Chinese food, uh, either takeout or eating in. So that's what we do. And my, I reminded my mom of this and, you know, she kind of was shocked that we weren't cooking and we weren't doing anything. And I had to tell her, I'm like, it is Jewish Christmas, mom. Like, this is what we've been doing for a long time, or at least I've been doing for 20 some odd years. Uh, so, you know, she's going to actually experience her third Jewish Christmas, but she's keeps forgetting that she's done it before with <laughs> us. <laughs> I I even got my dad into it a couple of years ago where he's like, this is awesome. We just go and get Chinese food. I was like, yeah, he's like, this is, this is great. I'm going to do this every year. So I didn't know that was the connection. Like my friends that do it, uh, they do it because of a Christmas story. So, well, and I always thought it was just that. So no, no, no. And, and and it was a good thing that, uh, uh, the Christmas story brought that in because a lot of people did not know, um, not that Ralphie and his family are Jewish, but a lot of people did not know that, you know, there were segments of the the American population that went to Chinese restaurants uh, for Christmas. But, yeah, that's that's where you would go if if you didn't have anything going on at your house or you didn't have anybody over. Or you didn't prepare any meals. You went to the Chinese restaurants. That's that's way nicer than how my family just picks a family member. And that's the one we eat this year. So. <laughs> That's good. The family member you eat or you eat at there? You know what? I, I can't keep talking about this where the cops can listen. We'll catch up another time. So, number so William, nine me, one what? <laughs> no, so, it's nine uh, one two. That's the real number. That's it. Shh. <laughs> that's right. Uh, so, so William, you hit me up for this. So what was it about Krampus that you were like, we got to do this? Okay. So the reason I picked Krampus is... I do not think this is a good movie. Let me be upfront about that to begin with. 
but I think it is a very fun movie. And I think there's a lot of stuff that we get to unpack here about family, family dynamics, family traditions around the holidays, uh, and all of the like old school pagan rituals that have been wrapped up into what we think of as Christmas traditions nowadays. Oh, yeah. I think the, the, the Krampus as a movie does a really good job of setting a lot of stuff up for that, for us to come back and talk about, try to unpack together some. Oh, I love that. That's great. Yeah. Um, you know, I'll, I'll straight out say that first, this was the first time I've seen this and I don't know how that's even possible because it seems like something I would have watched as soon as it came out. But uh, I was expecting so much more gore and so like way better kills. So I don't want to say I was disappointed, but it just didn't live up to the hype in my mind. It was still super fun, but I, I think if I'd gotten the kills I was expecting, this would be like one of my favorite movies for Christmas ever, you know? But Right. Do you, and do? do you know who the director was? Uh, I, I, I do, but I lost his name. Okay, so this is Michael Doherty, uh, the same guy that made Trick or Treat. Yes. So when I was coming into the movie, I was expecting like the Christmas Trick or Treat, which is one of my all time favorite Halloween movies. So let's just keep the festival horror or the 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 festival's not the right word. Holiday, yeah, but holiday, yeah, holiday sure. more one. Yeah, anyone who's heard our Trick or Treat episode knows that that is my favorite Halloween movie of all time. And I, I think that really contributed to this. I was expecting to get my Christmas movie that would be on that level. Mm-hmm. So so again, while, while I don't think I was disappointed, it just couldn't live up to the hype in my mind. Yeah. Well, not only that, there was also the marketing behind it where it... it, it it definitely presented itself as a very dark movie and, and possibly a very violent, gory, bloody movie. Um, not saying that you have to have that for it to be a good horror movie. Uh, but especially if you are, are craving that you're looking for it and you're going in expecting that. And you know, you, you kind of get let down because in your head you'd, you'd built it up so much. And then what you see is, um, it, it it falls short of what you wanted it to be in a lot of cases because there were some parts of this film where which uh, obviously we're going to get into and we definitely talked about before we recorded that you look at and you're like holy crap they could have done a much better job as far as with this kill or that kill or or even presenting in a different way even to stay within the PG PG thirteen range that they were trying to pull off uh, without having to go to a hard PG thirteen or even get it approaching an R rating. Um, but, you know, it I don't know. It just it there were moments, at least for me, um, where I kept expecting a little bit more. Like I, I, I was expecting Krampus to like bite somebody's head off or something. That would have been <laughs> awesome. But yeah, um, so so we all agree it's fun, but it just wasn't quite on the level we wanted. So, so I guess we can't debate that any further. No. Uh, so, William, jump me in, man. I know you have a lot of different things that you think this film hits for social commentary. So where do you want to begin, man? Um, let's start in the beginning and just work cool. our way through it. Um, Go for it. Because I think and I, th- I think you alluded to this before we started too. the movie kind of feels like three different movies sandwiched together, which, again, yes. with the trick or treat stuff like that, that makes so much sense because that's that is apparently Doherty's like, style mm-hmm. um, is, is smashing a couple of storylines together. But um, in the beginning, for me, this plays out like um, National Lampoon's mm-hmm. fam- uh, Christmas Vacation. Definitely. But just with all of the uh, awkward family drama cranked to an 11. Right. <laughs> and I think that is something that with the holidays coming up right now, and with us, like with people not really being able to get together with their families last year because of COVID and stuff. Like I know with our family, at least everybody's acting all excited. We get to see each other again. We're, we're all vaccinated. So let's let let's meet up in these small groups and stuff. And let, let's let's actually have a Christmas again. But kind of in the subtext of all of that with our family, it's like, oh, no, we have to actually see each other again <laughs> yay but oh 
Yeah, that's the uh, that's one is going to come back in and the, <laughs> just like all of that. And I think this movie does a better job than a lot of other movies I've seen of really just portraying that awkward dynamic yeah. and shoving it in our faces. Well, and like all I could think about watching this was how much harder would this be in today's conservative versus liberal versus Trumper versus whatever world? You know, like I was like, you kind of get like these little hints and pieces like uh, where uh, I think her name's Linda says like, you know, who gets free gifts, Democrats, you know, you get like these little (laughs) tiny, Mm -hmm. tiny hints of it. But I'm like, if this came out now, if he was writing it now, like those would hit so much harder, kind of like they do in uh, Knives Out, you know, like there's all these little, little, uh, oh, well, the fucking liberal kid over here or whatever, you know. And, and, uh, and I kid jerking off to deer. Yeah. To deer. <laughs> <laughs> God, I love that. But, uh, you know, you'd get more of that. But I thought that this really was kind of nice that it's not in that world because you still see that it's always kind of been that way. Mm-hmm. And it's just getting more head on collision these days. Well, yeah, because David Kickner's character, uh, Howard, would have shown. I mean, like this guy was the uh, I, I guess the archetype of 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 that right wing like this guy would have been storming the Capitol. you know he's got his hummer that he's he's making these comments about you know it's like oh well we could keep driving this thing until whatever you know he just makes all these comments and he brings guns with him to the christmas dinner <laughs> it, as one it, does yeah as one does uh as as is uh as is with the the expectations of that type of family member apparently um and just how how I guess just what shitty relatives they are for the most part. Uh, Cause they complain about everything coming into the house, but then you see how, at least for some relatives, um, it almost seems as though, well, I shouldn't even say it seems as though it's done out of obligation as far as these visits, these dinners, things like that, because the great thing about the world is, and I think this is something that the difference would be with a, a, a post Trump, um, uh, Christmas dinner is that people and post COVID for that matter, people are slowly realizing like, I don't have to waste my time or spend time with people. I don't want to spend time with. Um, so I think what would end up happening is it would probably end up being the neighbors or something. Um, which, which would add another dynamic. Like these are people that you see on a daily basis. And then it's like, oh, yeah, you know, come on over for dinner. We're going to be having whatever. And you invite them because you think they're not going to show up. Um, but then they show up. But yeah, this it, I haven't been in one of those 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 rooms or those dinners where it's so tense because someone is talking about politics or religion. Actually, I have been in the ones that are talking about religion. Uh, but tense talking about politics or things like that to where it's um where just the tension is so palpable where it's 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 there from the beginning it's before they even arrive it, it seems so problematic and and that itself um adds to the tension that you're expecting to experience with this film once Krampus or at least once anything shows up to disrupt their night well that okay so you've hit on two things I want to come back to here oh yeah yeah go um so first, with that build up to them dreading the other side of the family show up, showing up, I thought it was really interesting that when the family is dreading the other family showing up, they're in a lot of the same positions in the movie. And they're kind of having a lot of the same conversations as they do once they find out Krampus is coming. Right. Oh, wow. Like, there is this dreaded thing outside the house that's about to force its way in. And how do we just brace for that? That's um, really cool. Yeah. And I, I, I don't know if that was intentional or if it was just a bunch of limited sets so they could only be in so many different rooms. But it it, it seemed to me on this, I think it was my fourth or fifth watch here. Um, we, we, we put this movie on as background noise a lot. Um but but it just kind of struck me that they ended up in a lot of those same places, especially Adam Scott's character and his son. They they have a bunch of bonding moments about just dreading what's next and trying to trying to talk to each other about it. I love that. I uh, I again, this was my first time, so it's not something I paid attention to, but I'm definitely going to when I rewatch it now. 
Well, I can see that dread there because it, even when you know they lose the power and and the heat is going, on, you know, as far as the the fire is going out. I mean, you have all those things that that are definitely making you understand the discomfort that that family is going through because you're already in a in a spot with people that you barely get along with. I mean, you don't even get along with. You tolerate them. And now there's something that's adding to that discomfort. So yeah, that 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 definitely fits in and and you know, I I would argue that it is by design. Um because you got to have all of them there to to ramp up that anxiety. I just really like the comparison of uh relatives that I don't want in my house to a killer entity that, that, <laughs> that really uh, sums up a lot of my feelings. So There's I can identify heavily with that. <laughs> um, and then uh, another point that you made uh, about like the, this is our family and we've got to kind of hang out with them, but why do we have to hang out with them? Do we really have to hang out with them? Again, this was before COVID and all of this. I think Adam Scott's character had a really great, almost throwaway joke mm-hmm. uh, as he he's sitting upstairs in his son's room and Max doesn't want the, the relatives to come over. And he's saying, why do we have to let them come? And Adam Scott says something like, well, they're family. And Max's response is, well, why does that matter? Right. Adam Scott sits there for a second. like, Well, actually, I don't have a good answer for you, buddy. <laughs> and just moves on. Yep. It's like, yep. That, <laughs> yep. <laughs> I, it's always I kind of been that. my take on family. So I heavily identified with that line because uh, <laughs> I've never been the person that thought I have to do this because you're family. Like, uh, I've spent the majority of my life believing that family is chosen. And uh, right. so, so I really liked that line because I always think it's weird that these people I consider family go see people they absolutely fucking hate. And I'm like, you know, we could just hang out instead. (laughs) So I'm hoping COVID kind of taught some people that like if your family's super toxic or, you know, you just don't enjoy it. Like life's fucking short. Do something else unless there's a will and you know, you really need the house or no. (laughs) And the rights (laughs) to the books. (laughs) But yeah. What do you got, Don? no, I was going to say, you bring up a good point, which is the the whole idea of, of choosing family, right? Um, and I think that's something that's important to think about when we're when we're talking about, uh, I guess, a comparable, comparable situation to what's raised in the film. Um, you're not, at least with, 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 with this moment where there is that argument of, well, you know, this is family, this way it's supposed to be d- done. I've run into people in my own family and previous, you know, relationships and whatever, where that was always their their opinion, or at least their 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 fallback or or their 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 standby. Or sorry, their their the line that they wouldn't cross as far as like I'm going to make sure that I'm always, you know, having an amicable relationship with my family, or I'm going to make sure that things, you know, th- these these are my people. And my argument is. That means that you're going to put up with a lot of shit from people. I mean, I hate to say that, and it, but you're going to put up with a lot of shit from people because just because of what birth canal that came out of, you know, that, that there's some proximity to you. Um, and that ends up putting a lot of people in situations that they don't want to be in. I mean, for, for many r- different reasons. So you have people that would put up with uh, intolerant relatives, abusive relatives, family members who, who, you know, might not be accepting of who they are. And you make this argument of like, you know, this is family. We should, we should definitely get along. Ideally. Yeah. But that's, that's the Norman Rockwell bullshit as far as you have to, because, uh, and it's no different than, you know, a, a kid asking why something has to be a certain way and a parent responding because I said so. Uh, there, there's really no concrete reason or rationale as to why those relationships have to have to endure just because you happen to share a bloodline. Um, I'm all for it. And James, I mean, we, we've been in agreement about this for a while. Um, I'm all for cutting off family, you know, if, if, if they become toxic <laughs> or if they are toxic, uh, or if you just need, you know, uh, uh, if, if you just need space for your own mental health, like uh, no one should actually hold that over you. 
And I feel as though that this family is so beaten down as far as both sides. They, they're so beaten down with this idea of this concept that they have to do this. Like they even have to go get the aunt, the, the, the aunt that really, you know, is, is such a shit talker. They have to go get her because, you know, she would be alone for the holidays when is that really a big deal? Like, do, do you really have to make your holiday worse because this one person couldn't be by themselves? Depends who you are, I suppose. Well, I wouldn't. Well, the, the one productive thing that I think that Aunt Dorothy does is she teaches the kids how to make peppermint schnapps. Yeah, <laughs> that's the one bonding moment. <laughs> Which... It's great because it's, it's one. It's like the only thing she can do. She's not telling stories. She's not like uh, uh, Omi, where you know she's got this connection. Well, it's even Omi. I, I love the character because she is, I guess, the 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 soul of this family, the heart of the family, where she's keeping them somewhat connected to each other. Um, for you know, for a bunch of different reasons. If it hadn't been for her story, then you know uh, we would be missing out on a lot of stuff. But it seems as though she even chooses who she wants to interact with because she's speaking German the vast majority of the movie. And then all of a sudden she starts speaking English and, and on Dorothy's like, I knew it. I knew she could speak English. <laughs> and I took that as I have relatives who will not speak English uh, uh, on, on both of my sides of my family, as far as I'm sorry, on my side of the family, as well as my wife's side of the family. They won't speak English to around people they don't know because they want to test them out to see if like they're going to be an asshole about it or if they're going to say something about them and, and hope that they don't understand the English that's there. Um, so in, in some cases, they'll they'll pick up on some things that, you know, <laughs> other, other people thought that they didn't they didn't understand or weren't willing to understand. Uh, but that's their way of cutting someone off or at least not including somebody in you know, at least in their space of, you know what, fuck you, I'm going to go off and speak Spanish over here, or I'm going to go over here and speak French. And, um, you know, I, I can go live my life over here on this corner of the house with the other uh, French or Spanish speakers. And I don't have to include you in this because you you don't speak this language. So that becomes a barrier to where I know you're an asshole and I don't want you around me. So I'm going to go over here uh, in the same area to where I don't have to deal with you because you're not going to consume my time with some asinine conversation or gossip or anything like that. Well, one thing we missed in, and I, and I had this in my notes and I definitely want to go back to it. The opening of the movie is, I want to say it's chaotic, but it's normal. I mean, it's been so normalized because mm -hmm. the, the beginning of the film is, um, Showing people, I'm assuming Black Friday, but showing people out shopping <laughs> and trampling each other and fighting over stuff. And um, actually, no, it wasn't Black Friday because they were coming back from, I guess, Santa Claus or or, or play or something. I can't remember where it was, but they were coming back and, and you know, uh, chastising. Uh, um, oh, my gosh. Now I forgot his name. The kid's name. Max. Max. They were chastising him for getting into a fight. Right. Um, but it's showing like how normalized and desensitized we become to violence around you know black friday to where to the point where we look forward to those video clips on twitter on facebook or now on tiktok and instagram where people are just fighting with each other over a fucking tv or a toaster or any random you know material item that they might come into because you know it happens to be a good price I'm old enough, and I'm James is old enough as well, to remember the Cabbage Patch craze where people were literally fist fighting each other or picking up baseball bats in the sporting goods section of the, of the toy store and fighting one another over uh, uh, Cabbage Patch dolls. And, you know, in the 90s, it was the, the Tickle Me Elmo's, and then it became, you know, the the more the tech stuff where... Uh, I think last year it was PS5 where you had people that were willing to fight each other over or kill over them. Um, but it shows like how how violent we're willing to become for material items. And that kind of hits back to Omi and even Krampus's argument, which I mean, he doesn't uh, verbally make this argument. But the idea that people forgot what Christmas is about, it's not about 
going into a store and buying a bunch of shit or sitting on Santa Claus's lap. It's supposed to be about, you know, family or it's supposed to be about being good to one another, whether it's family or not. So when Omi gives her her story, or at least that flashback to her childhood, um, it it made me think back to the beginning of the film because that's what you know American consumer society has become around the holidays, which is I'm going to get my stuff for my kid, and I will run over, beat down, kill anybody who gets in the way of me buying, um, I don't know, a, a Nintendo Switch or something, and it doesn't matter what happens to this person or if I put somebody in the hospital, it just matters that I get this for my kid. So my kid can be happy for five seconds before they go play with something else. Cool. Hey, really fast. What time are we at? Uh, we are 26. Cool. Thank you. All Did right, I cut continue. out or something? No, I just got to edit one little thing, but okay. not a big deal. All right. Where do you guys want to go? Sorry. Um, I guess I can kind of transition into the next phase of the movie. Yeah, sure. Go for it. Okay. Um, so another thing that I thought was really interesting, um, this movie almost has fun breaking the rules of horror. <laughs> so we all know like, okay, so people are supposed to like do the bad thing and then their death is kind of the the penalty for doing the bad thing. Right. This movie kind of works in the opposite direction. It's like as soon as somebody gets their redemption, oh, there they go. So yeah. in my mind, the first person in this movie that really gets their redemption is Max's sister, who I don't think ever gets a name, but she actively chooses to go spend the holidays with somebody she actually likes, and then she gets the axe. Right. Uh, her and name then is it Beth. kicks off all the murders and all the crampusing. And, and uh, first, her name is Beth. Uh, Beth but that's it. um no, the thing I also love about that is she's doing a good thing. She's going to check on someone who could be hurting or something bad could have happened to them. So it's it's not even just trying to get away. I think that's definitely still there. And definitely when you're at that age, it's all about I want to see my boyfriend or whatever. But But she's legitimately going out to take care of someone. So I really <laughs> like that. And I yeah, think in that sense, selflessness. Yeah. And I, I think in that scene, too, they're still maintaining the this could be a true horror movie vibe. Um, the, the whole time she's getting hunted down in the snow outside, you're getting these like quick glimpses of Krampus. And then there's a jack in the box under the truck with her that I guess ominously, I, I don't know a better word, tinkling away. <laughs> um and it just it, it felt like that was the scene where the movie was really fulfilling its promise, like we talked about from the trailers and everything else. And I just I, I really liked that scene for a whole bunch of different reasons where the where, where Beth gets gets offed. Well, and I, I would argue that's my favorite scene in the whole movie. Everything from the moment that she's walking up to the house and sees it's frosted over. I mean, well. On a, on a higher level than frosted over. But, uh, <laughs> you know, and then she sees him on the roof when he jumps and starts like running across rooftops. Everything about that scene was what I wanted from this movie. Mm -hmm. So this scene made me so happy. And then going to what you were saying about slightly or, or more so subverting horror tropes and stuff. When the Jack in the Box is opening, it takes forever. Nobody has the timing on this. So many movies, we sit there and we're like, in four, three, two, you know, <laughs> and, and we know exactly when it's coming because they always deliver on that spot. And this movie does not do that. And, and I've been saying that about more and more movies, and that makes me happy because even when I know it's coming, I still want that jolt. Like, right. that's what we're that's why we're there. You know, um, I would have rather seen her get destroyed, but that's me. But outside of that, man, I love this whole scene with Krampus the first time. Well, and you bring up the the whole idea of seeing him, at least seeing a silhouette or, or a, a shape, right? You get an idea of his size and you get an idea of the fact that he's agile and fast. And But then on top of that, you also have the darkness of that night 
you have the cold, you have the wind that's whipping or whistling through through. Um, so you've got some some visual things, but then you also have some some auditory or some some sound issues and it, it, that are definitely helping to drive like this anticipation of of what's going to happen. You know, what is is Krampus going to get her? Or what's going to happen? Um, and what I definitely would have liked is, is, as you pointed out, I would have liked to have seen kind of this continuation along along that same path of. You know, she might see him abduct somebody or grab somebody and, and you know, like, oh, fuck, you know, it, that's, you know, thinking that she's seeing things, uh, but finally gets a clear glimpse of him. And then, yeah, like you said, she she gets attacked by him full on to where you can see it. It's gory, uh, you know, a, as opposed to, you know, kind of what we end up with. So for you, William, like when uh, when she gets killed and you don't see it. Like, did that work for you, or were you totally disappointed like I was? I think the first time I watched it, I was okay with it because I felt like they left room to escalate. Like, you don't you don't start the movie with your best kill. You got to build mm-hmm. up to that. So I, sure. I, I felt like them cutting away there was like, okay, okay, they 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 have they have set the tone now. We we are shifting from dread of the family into dread of the Krampus. We're going to start building that up now, and when this thing pops off, it is going to go all the way off. Because I can only imagine the terrible things that that Jack in the Box toy just did to that girl under that truck. And once that comes on screen, it is going to be glorious. And I was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> And and I think that's kind of where I was. What I really wanted to see, like if I was writing this, I wanted the Jack in the Box to go off and give you that little jump scare and nothing to happen. And just as she's like, okay, then she just gets ripped out from underneath and you just see her mm-hmm. screaming and disappear. Oh, that's, that would have been so good. Yeah. But we got what we got. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I do like that they uh, they keep bringing her back with the voice. And I like that it's not exact. Like it's clearly something trying to mimic her and and not getting it right. I thought that was such a nice touch. I just felt like if I was going to insult something, I should say something good as well. (laughs) No, I think that's good, though, because this whole second phase of the movie is genuinely creepy until you know where it's heading. Mm hmm. Yeah, um, you, you've you got that like screaming in the distance. You've got boxes showing up on the doorstep and snowmen just appearing outside randomly. And like if the payoff in the third act had been better, like I would have given this second act so much more leniency uh, because they they did ratchet up the tension, I think, exactly the way that they wanted to mm-hmm. uh, for a while here. Now, act two is just great. Um, again, I think act one is pretty good. Like the whole setting up how everybody feels and uh, really just making you identify with it. Cause I think all of us have been there at some point, you know? And, uh, and so, but again, they feel disjointed from one another, but it's, it's act three. Like you said, that just destroys it for me. I think I could have been okay with a lot more of this, but we'll get there. Well, before we do that, this is something I and, and since the two of you broken that up, this is something that I thought could have worked better. Um, not not the second act, but I mean, as far as the way it could have been constructed better overall, if you've got Oma there, right, you would have had a great opportunity where this family is sitting there. No one's getting along around the dinner. They're all making their passive aggressive re- remarks to each other and, and getting snippy about different things. Right. Omi comes in there. And it doesn't even become an issue of, oh, she's she's only speaking German or or shit. You could leave it as German. And and then um, her son is translating or even or even Max is translating. And she's sitting there telling them about, you know, my family had a Christmas like this once. And then it just totally just gets darker at that moment where she's telling this story. And she I guess the, the Krampus story itself gets explained to everyone so now it's in their head of like oh you know there's some shit outside this is you know the the power now goes out or you start hearing the screaming you start hearing the 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 sound of the hooves and things like that which by the way that was a funny moment for me 
when I'm watching the film where they, they go searching for, uh, for Beth and they see the hoof print in the snow and David Kector's character, Howard is like, you know, I hunt a lot. I, I, I don't know what that is. And, uh, the, the remark, at least from his brother-in-law, is like, oh, yeah, it could be a goat. He's like, what kind of goat is that? There's When did goats start walking on their hind legs? I'm like, wait a second. How did we determine that this was hind legs or <laughs> forward legs? Because, you know, it, it's it's like, you know, with, with Tom, Tom. With Tom, you know, he makes that uh, makes that connection of like, oh, these, these, these look like uh, goat's hooves. And... At that moment, it kind of took me I'm like, how, how would you know that it was it was standing up on its hind legs? Like if you see two prints or you see a print, then you start looking for the other one. You're going to assume, OK, well, it's 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 definitely walking on four legs. There, there's nothing out here that's going to walk on two hooves. Um, and you could have easily had this moment where they they went back to Omi's story. And like, yeah, you know, she's really she really fucked with our head with that whole Krampus thing. And, you know. Then you can have that really good, healthy mix of comedy and horror. If you're not going to go fully dark, you could have a really good mix of comedy and horror. Yeah, I like that. I'm also trying to figure out how big the goat is that Tom's ever <laughs> seen before. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not those yoga goats. <laughs> All right, Krampus, just walk on my back for a second while I go into child's pose. <laughs> yoga with Krampus would be amazing. <laughs> well it wouldn't just be him i mean you'd have the elves and you'd have the gingerbread man and you'd have uh you know i guess you'd have to do the yoga you'd have the you'd have the bears you'd have a bunch of little toys and stuff that would be keeping you company well there's also a goat there there's a there is a goat elf once we get to that point in the movie um, oh yeah Doherty was saying that when the elves show up, each of the elves is apparently modeled after some other cultures, like Christmas, Christmas entity thing. So there, mm-hmm. there's a goat one for I don't know, Russia, maybe. Um, but 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 yeah, there, there's there's pint sized Krampus for the for the faint of hips. Huh. See, these are all reasons I have to watch it again now. This is why I do this show, so that I can find out what I was supposed to pay attention to the first time. <laughs> I should just talk or to everybody the beforehand. Could just make it more obvious what you're supposed to pay attention to the first time. I'll just start talking to guests beforehand. What do you want me to watch for? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, one of the things that really I thought got built up a lot and then sort of delivered was Howard makes a big deal out of, you know, being a gun boy and being excited and, oh, you were just, you were in, what was he, an Eagle Scout or whatever and making fun of that. Mm -hmm. And and we get it a little bit. We get the gun fails and Tom saves him. But I really thought this was going to build somewhere for the end as well. I thought, like, some Eagle Scout thing was going to be the thing that that solved everything. And instead, it just kind of petered out and it was gone. And uh, I don't know. Did that like were you guys looking for that as well? Or was it just because this was my first time or what? No, I think I think you're, that's a fair assessment because there you normally have some type of callback. Right. Um, or at least you have some some implementation of somebody's past being being brought for or at least what they prepared. Because he even makes that com- Tom makes that comment of like, oh, I was in training. And Howard says, like, training what? To be in the Army, the Marines, Eagle Scout. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. Um, that would have been, you're right, that would have been a great moment to come back to where, I don't, even just to be funny. Like, he finds his old, you know, uh, I don't, I wouldn't want, but he finds, like, his merit badge sash or something, or unless that's just Girl Scouts that do that. But he finds his merit badge thing, and, like, he, I don't know, uh, puts it around Krampus's throat and, you know, tries to strangle him. I don't know. There could have been so many different things that you, you pulled out um, to, to uh, aside from him, you know, shooting the shotgun and uh, then eventually getting dragged into the, into the snow. And I don't know if either of you know anything about Eagle Scouts and stuff, but like, is there a different mentality? Like, is it, is it not as much about the military? Because the Eagle Scouts I knew went into the military so, like, it was a really weird joke for me because my experience was that's the same thing. 
So, like, do either of you know anything about this stuff or not? Well, you, yours is different than me because every Eagle Scout I knew didn't go into the military. I only knew a couple, so it's probably a, a bad uh, example, but still. Um, my experience with the Boy Scouts was the first, like, three ranks while I was in elementary school and my dad was forcing me to go to it. So I don't think my <laughs> input here is going to be very useful. <laughs> I remember to cut away from myself instead of towards myself when I have a knife and full stop. Hey, that's still something that could have saved your life. You don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, cool. I didn't learn anything. I, I was a tiger cub and then I wasn't allowed to uh, continue on because I moved to Mississippi and the flag wasn't changed until 2020. So my dad <laughs> yeah. was like, nope, nope. If we move, you can be, you can definitely be it, but not in this state. You're not wearing that fucking flag on you. Uh, okay. Because again, it was the requirement at the time that you wore the state flag on your uniform as opposed yeah. to the, I guess now they all wear the U S flag, which even then it's still weird. No, that's uh, that's actually one of my favorite stories about your dad because I remember you talking about how you wanted to have the General Lee from Dukes of Hazard. Oh yeah, and anyone let you have that either? Oh and, no, he got it, but oh, he, he got took, it. Yeah, he took a metal file and filed off the flag off the top, off the roof of the car, and I was I was like, it doesn't look like the General Lee anymore. And he's like, it's good enough. It's like you're not going to have that shit in my house. <laughs> Now I'm nah. I'm adding some dialogue, but you know that's that's pretty much the sentiment <laughs> that, that was there, uh, because I have no problem calling that that piece of cloth a piece of shit. So there you go. Because I, I I think Act Two does a lot of really good character building, but there's not a ton to talk about there, other than people just getting progressively more and more um, kind of desperate and mm-hmm. looking for ways out, and then the freaking hook comes down the chimney yes and i thought it was about to be on because the this one a... cousin stands up and he goes to look at the hook <laughs> and if this was a rated r movie that's the moment that they just jerk that thing up and the gore fest kicks off but instead we get a gingerbread man sliding down, and I had to pause the movie the first time to try to wrap my head around what the hell was happening. So this is legitimately the only note that I wrote down for the whole movie. I wrote, this kid, and then in parentheses it says, one of the O'Doyles slash Augustus wow. Goop. <laughs> so... <laughs> I just had to share that because I think that rules that sums him up completely. But uh, no, this scene, I I didn't mind the gingerbread man. I thought it was a little weird, but I was excited as shit because I was like, where are you going from here? Hell yeah. (laughs) Okay. This got weird. Let's do this. And then no. And uh, (laughs) so I didn't have the same reaction to the gingerbread man, but I, I do think that this scene hit that thing that we were all looking for with this movie. Like just that shot from inside the fireplace as the hook drops down. Like that's like a, a fucking cheering. Oh hell yeah. Here we go. A moment, you know? Mm-hmm. And, and this brings me back to that scene I was talking about earlier with Krampus running across the rooftops. Like if the whole movie was these scenes, this thing would be an immortal classic. And, and it's not. But uh, no, so the gingerbread man, I adored it. I thought it was such a, a different way to go. And I love that it waits until he, he, it gets bit. Like you could have fought him off sooner and not getting your head bit, dude. You know, <laughs> but um, no, I, I thought it was crazy. And I was so excited by the sad day. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Don? Did you did you like Gingy or not? Gingy? You, <laughs> I had to. He's got gumdrop buttons. I think their buttons. names were Lumpy, Clumpy. I, I looked up their names. Seth uh, Green, Lumpy, Justin Dumpy, Rowling. and Clumpy. That was the names <laughs> of the of the ginger. And I did not know this at the time, but Seth Green was one of the gingerbread men. Yeah, and Justin Rowland and uh, <laughs> Green Burns, I think, does one of them. So, yeah. I, I, I know that. That's I, awesome. <laughs> I was anticipating something there as well. Um and, and especially since the entire family is, you know, is out, you know, in the living room, they're out 
I mean, out cold as far as they're sleeping. And then the the calm is broken because the fire itself dies out, which, again, it's one of those things that you wait for in a horror film, uh, especially something like this, especially when the chimney it becomes a character or becomes part of the story. Um, when that fire starts to die down, you're kind of like, all right, some shit's about to happen because it, it's that's never... Uh, that's never something that that the fire dies out and something doesn't happen as a result. You know, it it uses a distraction and like a window, a, you know, a tree or something uh, comes to the window or somebody busts through the door. But the idea of sending those chains and everything down the the chimney itself, um, when it, it pulls that contrast that you have to Santa Claus, right, coming down the chimney to bring you something good. Where here's Krampus coming down the chimney or sending something down the chimney for for bad or for evil reasons, um, but I could imagine my mom as I, as I brought up on this on this show many times I could imagine my mom sitting there watching this kid walk towards the 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 gingerbread man that's at the end of this and saying things like, "What the fuck are you doing? Why are you going <laughs> to that?" Thing? Like all this stuff that's weird is going on, and and she probably would have made like a you know a really mean comment about you know the kid's parents or something like that, um, and you know once he once he got snatched away, she would make a comment like that's what your dumbass gets for going after gingerbread that comes down your your chimney. Um, but it, for me, I, I again it was one of those tension driving moments that's 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 shot greatly. Um, but I th- I think we are we are robbed because of the the rating system. Um, if if you've got really a, an evil character, is the evil character really going to give a shit if it's a kid or an adult that that's getting its head ripped off or, um, you know maybe the the here's if you're really going to go that route of like we're going to keep it PG right or PG thirteen the kid bites the gingerbread man turns into a fucking gingerbread man sure. And and, yeah. and, and and then, then Krampus gets, and then eats gets, him. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Yes. You, yes. You that's turn great. Into that, as opposed to, oh, he just he bit the gingerbread man and you know took one of his gumdrops, one of his beautiful gum, beautiful gumdrop buttons, um, and you know gets gets taken away, gets whisked away, gets attacked. I would have loved to have seen it the other way, where you know he becomes a victim of his own his own greed or his own gluttony because you see him just you know eating and consuming whatever the hell he wants. This would have been a great moment where Krampus punishes you based off of what you do. So that, that would have worked for me. And it, it kills me that the hook itself goes completely to waste. Yeah. Like they don't, yes. they don't hook anybody. They wrap that chain around the kid and then they pull him up the chimney with the chain. But I think at uh, reading up on this, it sounds like, the, the the producers really stepped in in two spots. Like originally the movie was supposed to be Krampus going house to house in some neighborhood and wrecking <laughs> stuff. That sounds awesome. Which probably would have felt a lot more trick or treat ish. Like each house would have had its own storyline. Who knows? Mm-hmm. And then the producers got involved and said, no, don't make this an R rated movie. Bring it down to PG 13. And I feel like this is exactly the moment in the movie that the writer's room went back and we're like, okay, everything before this is fine, but let's, 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 let's salvage this point forward. What do we do with the hook? If it's not going to go in the kid, eh, I don't know, wrap it around him. I mean, at least it's a, yeah. And at least it's a good, like uh, when he's getting pulled up, like it legitimately looks like he's hung, you know, like mm-hmm. the way his body's hanging. It doesn't look like a uh, he was nicely lifted up on an elevator, you know, like it, it looks painful, but it's also fast. And that could be why. And I thought like when I was watching it and I didn't know this, I kind of thought like, man, you wasted an opportunity there. Like I would have held him and let you see the pain for a second and then sucked him up. Like I, I thought that would be cool, but yeah. What you're saying makes makes a lot of sense of why it ended up the way it did. But we're also sick human beings who want to see that stuff. Absolutely. <laughs> and, uh, and you know, I'm not a big person who believes that, like, all horror needs to be rated R. But the one complaint that I will always have is I don't believe that stuff like this can happen and nobody cusses the whole time. Like, you can't watch your kid get sucked up that way and be like, oh, golly gee, did you guys see that? 
and and that will always bother me about movies and the, oh, the show. Darn it! There goes Howie Look, Jr. We all know that Aunt Dorothy is not going to do that. You know, exactly. She, she's no. she's three sheets to the wind at one point, so this at least getting where, close to it. This is where they need an older black lady that's there who just doesn't give a shit about anything. She'd be like, "Oh, you see that white motherfucker?" You know, <laughs> I, that would be. That would really help me with this. I think I need voiceovers for this movie and I'll enjoy no, it. No, here's what would happen. You would have that neighbor. <laughs> let's just say it's let's just say it's like a Leslie Jones character, right? Oh, yeah. I think Leslie great. Jones would be great in this movie. You have <laughs> Leslie Jones who happens to be the neighbor. She's looking through like if you have Krampus going door, house to house, right? Going chimney to chimney. He doesn't even have to go, you know, to the door <laughs> or through the windows, right? So you've got <laughs> Leslie Jones who's seeing this outside of her window, and she's like, Oh. Oh, well, he's over at the Campbell's house. <laughs> <laughs> Drinking Oh, soup. shit. He grabbed the Campbell kid. He's got the Campbell kid dangling by a fucking hook. <laughs> Marvin, Marvin, come over here. And you, I would and her, 100% watch this movie. This look, sounds And her amazing. husband, Marvin, is sitting, like, drinking a hot cocoa with marshmallows, complaining about, like, you know, I don't know, whatever happens to be on TV, just saying like, oh, I'm trying to watch Die Hard. You know, he's trying to watch some other movie, right? So you could have a juxtaposition of, of you've got a really violent movie that he's watching on TV, or he happens to be watching the, you know, the 24-hour marathon of, of Christmas Story. But she's sitting there looking out the window, you know, seeing all this stuff that's taking place. And then finally, you know, whatever, you know. Uh, he he gets her attention. She comes back, and then she goes back over by the window and sees like you know, Cramp is going into another house. And he's like, uh huh. That's what you get for leaving your trash can out when it. This is an HOA. <laughs> Just some ridiculous reason as to why she's saying that there that whatever it is is happening to to her neighbors. This is why I mind my own damn business. I don't fuck with demons. <laughs> <laughs> if, if the makers of this movie ever listen to this, I hope they just issue a recut just adding these scenes. I would, I, I think it would solve everything for me, and I'd be very happy with it. Just give me an autograph from Leslie Jones. That's all I want. <laughs> just, just hook it up. That's all I want. <laughs> hook it up, really? After the hook wasn't used correctly? Gosh. Oh, man, I was trying. I was trying there. <laughs> Nailed it. Uh, I see what you did. <laughs> well, there was, I don't know if any of you, fa- yeah, I'm sure James was thinking about this. I'm sure James was worried about the dog. Um, because at one point they allow the dog to go up and, and confront or at least to see what is going on upstairs, which again, I, I thought was a good comedic device, but it's not good for horror because that immediately turns into, is the dog going to die or is the dog going to survive? But the dog itself has a couple of cool scenes where, you know, the ginger, one of the gingerbread men is about to, to, to get Uncle Howard. And she, yeah, she uh, jumps up and actually eats the gingerbread man uh, while he has a very sharp uh, peppermint cane. So, <laughs> or peppermint candy cane, which I thought was hilarious. It was fun. I'm always worried about the poor little dog. Yes, I know you are. <laughs> so sad. But it also made me think about how my dog would react in that situation. Rocky would just leave. He'd be like, nah, I'm not dealing with this shit. I don't know. He might actually eat the he might actually eat the cookie. The, the, <laughs> and he'd bark All at right. it and then eventually just like, Yeah, I'm gonna have to eat you. <laughs> so we were talking about how the gingerbread thing happens and we were expecting so much more. And instead, we get this almost disappointing Act 3. <laughs> and uh, William, we want to walk us through what you didn't like about the endings here? Sure. Um, oh my gosh, there's so much here. Let, let, let's just start with one thing at a time, I guess. Absolutely. Uh, so, uh, again, reading up on this a little bit, the third act was intended to be this, all of the various elements of Mm -hmm. what we celebrate christmas through uh kind of not reverting back to their original pagan forms um but at least like reflecting the horror that they started with so like uh krampus is krampus obviously uh and then there's so many other things about our christmas culture that we just 
take for granted and run with nowadays, but they've got these really weird beginnings like Christmas trees were apparently evergreen trees had some sort of anti ghost. Um, uh, this isn't the right way to phrase this, but vibes about them. So people used to plant evergreen trees around their house to keep the bad spirits away. Okay. Um, presents, you would originally put presents on other people's doorsteps uh, so that hopefully when evil spirits came around near the holidays, like the presents would effectively act as sacrifices to keep the spirits away. Hmm. Um, witches. The, the the reason you would have a fire burning in your fireplace overnight was to keep the witches from coming down your chimney and stealing your children. Um, the, the, there's just a lot of stuff wrapped into the Christmas tradition that's just very different from the way that it was originally presented in our world. And we get to see a lot of those things just blowing up in this family's face uh krampus has through whatever krampus magic he has re re demonized uh some of these some of these elements and twisted them to his own purposes um and i love that in theory but then what we get is gingerbread men running around with sharpened candy canes and we get uh a uh, evil angel thing from the top of a Christmas tree flying around and trying to bite people. <laughs> and we get a Jack in the box trying to taking of Deborah Logan, people in the attic. And it, it's all done with these very interesting ideas in play, but just not in any sort of a fulfilling way. Yeah. This really felt to me like producers getting in the way. And I don't know. I have no way to know for sure, but like this seems like, Oh, make it more fun. Make it more this. And like, and when too many people get involved with something, ideas get very scattered and no longer make sense. And mm -hmm. that's how this felt to me. So while I don't know that that's what happened, I feel like that's what happened. I, I think it's very hard to swing from a animated gingerbread man on fire, mm -hmm. flying through yeah. the air to stab you. <laughs> that's a definite tone that you're trying to set. Yes. And then you go into the attic and it is the scene from hereditary where Tony mm -hmm. Collette's hanging and trying to like get out of this noose. Like though I, those two things can't coexist in the same movie. Well, <laughs> and definitely not next to each other. Right. Yeah. No, it, <sighs> It just started taking so many turns that it was hard to hard to stay connected to it. Mm -hmm. um, one of my biggest things is uh, actually way earlier. It's the flashback when uh, Omi is that her name mm -hmm. when when she's talking about being a child and how that was animated. Like that instantly like pulled me out. I was like, that's weird. Like I, it didn't work for me. Like later when all these other animations are happening then then it worked better for me but it was still odd and i don't know i just i feel like the tone was never decided on throughout this whole film and that's that's why it, it would have been better if this had been omi is telling stories and maybe each one of the stories is animated you know that same type of thing and that way you can stay i guess pg because animated gore isn't the same uh i mean you have it on the simpsons so you have it on all these cartoons that are on regular television. Her story is scary as a story. The way it's presented, it's almost comical. Because uh, I, I immediately thought of Coraline when it showed up on, on screen. Uh, Ooh, because it, that's good. It, and not nothing against Coraline, but Coraline is not something I look at and think like, oh, yeah, this is really going to you know ratchet things up with respect to being scared or, or at least being uh, being anxious about what's going to take place. Yeah, I could see that. Definitely. It, it definitely has that same kind of feel to it. I don't know. Um, I think one of my other problems is like, if you're going to animate things, like shouldn't Krampus be more animated unless I don't know if realistic's the right word, but you know what I'm saying? Like, I, I just felt like even, even the animation couldn't make up its mind where we were going when, and, and sometimes that works, but it did not work here for me. Everything just felt disjointed. 
Yeah, in a couple of frames, it kind of looks like the shadow puppets from Candyman. And then it's yes. like classic Christmas, like Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer animation and mm-hmm. then Coraline. And yeah, just a little bit all over all over the place, like the third act. I guess at least they didn't have the eyes from the Polar Express. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about ratcheting up the fear. That would have done it. <laughs> um. I don't know how much more of this part you want to talk about, but I just want to say the end also feels the same way to me. Like that part dragged on too long when he wakes up and yeah, everything's back to normal, but it's not like, I felt like that was like twice as long as it should be. And, and so it just felt like another piece that wasn't really connected to anything. And the kick that it was supposed to have was lost because we all know it's coming. So it was just boring instead. Yeah. Like as uh, soon as he wakes up, are any of us thinking, oh, yeah, maybe this really didn't happen, you know? But then but, you're, but, you're, you're reminded, or at least when he finds that bell in, in, the, in, in the present, or at least has the present of the bell, that it almost, it almost triggered everybody's memory at that moment to where maybe they all had that dream and it's kind of like, oh, it was kind of fucked up. I'm not going to... Because... No matter what your dream is, you're not going to wake up on Christmas and then tell everybody, hey, guess what? I had this really fucked up dream last night. And you Um, were there? You were there? Yeah, exactly. You're waking up on Christmas and it's kind of like, especially those kids. Those kids, Howard's kids, um, yeah, they're definitely going to be more concerned with their gifts because they're going to wake up, not going to say anything that happened, but then think, oh, shit, it's Christmas. I got all my gifts downstairs, Uh, which oddly... It, it tells you that nothing changed with that family because they still, even though uh, Max was wishing, you know, he it, Christmas was the way it, it used to be or it should have been or whatever. Um, one of his cousins, was it Stevie or Jordan? One of them gets brass knuckles for <laughs> as a Christmas present uh, and then punches it into her fist to, as a threat to Max. Yes. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's, it's weird how, it seems as though it nothing has changed, but then things have changed. Well, I didn't sense? mean to. Yeah, definitely. I didn't mean to totally jump ahead like this. We can go back no, and no, talk no, no, about no, no. the hellfire and everything. But like, like this is kind of my issue with it is I feel like like the punch was supposed to be, oh, but it did happen because we all remember it. And I thought the way they executed that, where everyone like turned and looked at it, I thought that was really powerful, but it was just lost in this piece that took too much time. Mm-hmm. I don't know. But we can back up because, you know, I skipped some good stuff and I didn't no, mean no, to. No, 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 that's fine. So <laughs> um, when, when we get the final showdown with Krampus, and I don't know if you want to go anywhere else with this, William, before we get to the, the final showdown, I should ask that first. Um, the attic scene is a lot of fun. There's a lot of cool monster designs yeah. thrown in there for 15 seconds and then moved on from, <laughs> and then the parent genocide in the snow, <laughs> like they kill half the characters in the movie in a span of 20 seconds with no resolution or anything for any of them. Yeah. I don't know if there's a lot to talk about there, but there should be, but Mm -hmm. I don't think there is. So for me, like from a writing point of view, if you were going to do this, then the payoff should have to be that Max has to come through on his own. He's lost his sister. He's lost his parents. He's lost Omi. You know, like there's no one there to protect him. He wanted to be a grown up and stop believing. So you got to be a grown up and fucking deal with reality now. Right. Mm-hmm. And we don't right. get that. Like he says, I'm sorry. And then he gets thrown into the hellfire thing. But like, how is that a resolution? That's what bothered me. I'm expecting this moment. Maybe something his dad taught him comes through or, you know, like believing does something and instead Krampus just wins. And then he's like, ha, none of it was real. It's fine. And the fact that they fast forwarded the last act of the movie to get to that moment and then had no payoff, like really gutted me. Like I could have excused them if they just killed all the parents in order to get Max isolated. 
so he could make that big decision. Like, that's cool ish, I guess. But I mean, then, even, yeah, like you were saying, he just gets thrown in. <laughs> even if we got to see the deaths more and spend more time with each one so that they would matter, because I feel like we care about these characters on some level by this point. They did a good job with that. So you should make me care about their death. And then, and then even if Max still lost, if it was still that it's not enough because he's not an adult, mm -hmm. I think that would be a fun ending. Like, I think that would carry some weight that he is still in this place between child and adults and even between child and teen, you know? And, and I think you could have done some stuff with that. And instead it's just over. It's a very odd choice to me. Well, this kind of leads to a big question I had for the two of you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if this is supposed to be Max's big moment of redemption, like him, him learning his lesson, him, him like confronting Krampus, that implies that he had some major deficiency to begin with. Do you all think Max actually did anything wrong in the beginning of this movie? No. I mean, it was just his Christmas wish. But it's not even that. He was bullied to a point where he was forced to rip up the thing he believed in. That's mm -hmm. not not believing. That's I don't want to be treated this way. Right. Yeah, I think the whole premise is flawed. Yeah, and that's, like, if the whole movie hinges on him wishing his family was dead, like, what 10-year-old hasn't wished that before? Like, and before then the gone family. on to regret it, but, like, that's, oh, my family's being mean to me. And this is a really toxic family. Like, if any kid is going to be pushed to losing the Christmas spirit in a moment of weakness... It's Max. It's with this family. Like, how are we supposed imagine, to be him for that? Yeah, like, when they're reading his letter at the table, that's some of the most emotionally damaging shit I've seen in a movie in a long time. Mm -hmm. Like, it's completely unrealistic to think Max wouldn't feel this way afterward. Like, he's just had one of the worst nights of his life. If anything, Krampus should have shown up and give that kid a hug and gone and slapped those two and then gone back to wherever. <laughs> or Krampus punishes everybody else except for him. Yeah. You know and, that? And Tom. I don't feel like Tom did much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe he lied about being an Eagle Scout. Maybe. <laughs> Which is why he didn't whip out the merit badge at the very end. Where has he been that he's <laughs> never home anyway? I don't no, know the way I, he was handling that shotgun. It, it, that tells me that wasn't his first time. Because <laughs> he was he was like John Wick with that thing. And, and can I ask what happened to Howard's injury? Because one second it's like his leg's going to fall off. And then after that, he's walking around with everybody. I didn't understand this at all. Hmm. It's very strange to me. Shot my leg off. <laughs> or, no, no, no. She turned me into a newt. I got better. <laughs> <laughs> Tis just a flesh wound. <laughs> Bring out your dead. But yeah, I don't know. There's a, again, this movie's fun. Like I, I'll definitely rewatch it. Cause I had a blast watching it. It's mm -hmm. just, we're kind of dicks on this show and complain about everything that's wrong with everything. <laughs> so, you know, we're horror fans. <laughs> that's that's what we do. <laughs> so Don, had you seen this before or not? You know, I asked Claudia. She said I she said I watched it before. Um, I swore up and down I didn't because I kept I kept putting it off. I'm like, I'm going to watch it this Christmas. This, I'm going to watch it this Christmas. So I'm thinking the movie came out three years ago. Then I saw that it came out in 2015. I don't remember watching it. I think I remember the beginning of the movie with everyone getting trampled and fighting over presents. But after that, I don't remember anything about the movie. Uh, but she swears up and down that I watched it with her. Uh, maybe that was, you know, she was with her boyfriend and I just, you know, I, she's, she's trying to come up with excuses. Um, <laughs> yeah, you saw it with me. <laughs> uh, but no, I, I don't recall seeing it before. Uh, but this is definitely what I'm going to have. I'm going to have her sit down and watch, uh, with me again, uh, <laughs> according to her. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's. I hate to ever say that something is due to be redone, but I think this should be redone in the light that it, that I guess it's, it's first intention was, which was to be 
a Christmas ver- and I, I don't want to say it like that, but a Christmas version of what Trick or Treat was for Halloween. I, I agree. I'd like to see a shutter version of this. Oh. Yeah. Because, you know, anything goes and Yeah. And, and and I think that's what this needs. I think I think the fear of Krampus the legend has to be there. And and it's not with this. And it's fun and that's great, but man, I want to see an all out fucking crazy ass Krampus. Well, plus you want you want to have a, at least people in the as far as the characters, you want to have characters who are familiar with Krampus to where you know this is something you should be afraid of. Yes, yeah, like they don't know what's happening, so like the fear is never totally there. Maybe that's what this needed. Maybe this needed to be one of those movies where the first half they don't know what's happening, then they get the reveal, and then they have to deal with that consequence. You know, um, maybe that would have done it for me. Yeah. And if you had Omi telling that story at the beginning, you know, she gets pissed off because of, of fighting at the table or the 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 again, the passive aggressive behavior or, or or just the back and forth. And she just snaps and says, you know, oh, my family acted like this once before. And um, and what ended up happening is Krampus came and visited and killed half the village, you know, something like that. And then they kind of blow it off as, oh, Omi's just telling whatever crazy uh, stories about growing up in in the old country, and she does one of those cliched. Oh, you'll see, you'll see tonight, and you know. And, <laughs> oh. and then we find out that she called him on her family. Yes, and now she's taught Max to do the same. <laughs> yes, there it is. <laughs> oh man, you guys have any final thoughts on this before we shut it down, or anything we missed in your notes? I think the one last thing that I've got written down is, uh, are y'all Parks and Recs fans? I am, yeah. I'm an Office fan. I only okay. go camping the way Tom does. <laughs> there is a, there is a, I don't know if it's right to call this a conspiracy theory or just a like chosen headcanon, um, but Ben's character in Parks and Rec constantly refers to the Ice Town incident from before <laughs> he moved to... Uh, <laughs> Before he moved to the Parks and Rec city, whatever it is. Amazing. Pawnee, yes. That the, there is a headcanon that this is the Ice Town incident. This is his inciting incident. And uh, I think in the context of Parks and Rec, <laughs> maybe this movie makes a whole lot more sense. And then we find out that Krampus is really Ron Swanson. So <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty great. So uh, well, this how is do you the part. Packer, yeah. though. Oh, that's right. You guys are. Yeah, David Koechner plays the traveling salesman uh, Packer uh, oh, in, in, in the office. That's right. And he, uh, you know, he he wants to take a desk job because he got a couple of love bumps on his ding dong. So <laughs> he's an outdoor cat and he needs to become an indoor cat. Maybe he really wants to take a desk job because his legs still mangled from that bear trap. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> That also explains why he wasn't at Dunder Mifflin when when Dwight was dressing up as Belchnickel. <laughs> he would have seen it and run. Exactly. As fast as his one leg would let him. You again. <laughs> <laughs> and Charlie Sheen was out of town, so Aunt Berta didn't have to work this weekend as a housekeeper. And so she had to come to Christmas. Yeah, this all makes a lot of sense. Um, sorry. Where did she drink on that show? <laughs> If she didn't, she should have. I don't know. I didn't watch it that much. I oh, okay. Can resist the I, two and a half men reference. So, uh, yeah, this brings us to the part where we talk about movies people should watch if they liked this. And I, I think it's fair to say that all three of us are going to say trick or treat. So we'll just skip that. Uh, William, what else should people watch if they liked this film? Um, I think the film that has the same holiday spirit as this, but actually gets the humorous almost kid focused horror aspect of it right is gremlins uh, hell yeah yeah uh, i i think they they have the same kind of a beginning build up where there there's something definitely off about this but then when the fun cracks off in gremlins it's it, it is a lot more focused than this movie definitely 
All right. Um, for my double feature type thing, I'm going to throw out the Nightmare Before Christmas. Okay. I think that this, uh, again, the tone is totally off in this, but I think it kind of fits that whole adulty but still childlike memories and and yet hitting some horror with Christmas. And I think they'd be kind of cool together. All right, Don. Okay. What are your 25 for I'm Christmas? surprised you didn't see what Anna, I did there. Anna versus 25. the Apocalypse. I'm surprised you didn't go there. Oh, my gosh. Every, every single thing on the planet should be watched with Anna because Anna should just always be watched. But <laughs> it's my favorite Christmas movie. I just subjected my sister-in-law to it while she was here. It was Is pretty she great. Singing along She's singing with it? No, you know, I mean, she's not a horror person, so uh, it was it was really fun to watch her, and especially when one of the big deaths happens that like rips everybody up as it is. I just sat there watching her while it happened, and it it was just like the greatest feeling. So yeah, yeah, let's throw on in here as well. <laughs> but go ahead, go ahead. All right, uh, we already mentioned, or it was already mentioned, uh, National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation because Howard definitely has the the cousin Eddie. Uh, thing going on uh harold and kumar christmas little evil um because there is uh, adam scott basically plays the same character he's like that dad who's a little bit lost and um uh, bad santa i threw in there better watch out which is uh, i would say is an underrated christmas horror uh ready or not uh and knives out i think got mentioned when we were talking scrooged yeah. is one uh that that definitely if you had a moment where the, the ghost of Christmas past was kind of like, or Krampus was like the ghost of Christmas past, I think this movie would have definitely been improved. Uh, Jingle all the way. And that's it. Uh, Cause gremlins has been said. Gremlins would be so much fun with this. <laughs> it really, really would. Anyway. So William, let's bring it back to you, man. Where can people find you online and social media and buy your stuff and all those good things? Um, Pretty much just Twitter for now. I'm looking to branch out a little more into the Instagrams and maybe book talk if I can figure out how to dance. I don't know. Um, Sweet. But for now, uh, I'm on I'm on Twitter with at spooky underscore Sterling, and I would love to talk to anybody there. All right. So until next time, as always, I'm James Sabata. And I'm Don Guillory. And we will see you next week here at the Necronama.com.